At the dawn of the 20th century, America was a country full of promise and hope for many. Black Americans faced a different reality, a nation separate and unequal. Yet their hope persisted. Pained by inequality, but inspired by resilience, writer and civil rights activist James Weldon Johnson put pen to paper. His words would become a unifying call, a hope for a brighter tomorrow, a timeless exhortation to lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the forces that want to take us back to another place. We don't want to go back. We want to go forward. When Lynn asked if I would do a service this year, I said yes, because I knew I wanted to speak about why I'm a member of the NAACP. Um, I had recently watched the Ken Burns documentary about the Holocaust in America. Has, have people in here watched that? If you haven't, I, I strongly advise it. It's very, very powerful. Uh, and as I watched it, I, I was dismayed and shocked by the dismissive attitude of the world's mostly first world people to what was happening to the Jews in Germany and in the occupied territories. How even here in America, when the facts of the extermination camps were known, the general population just shrugged, and I found it chilling. Um, the one positive thing that stood out to me was a single sentence in that six-hour production when Burns stated that the uh, UUs and the Quakers did all they could to rescue victims, even putting themselves at harm's way. And that one sentence just undid me, and I, I burst into tears, and I just couldn't stop crying. And uh, even now it gets me that there was a group that cared. And uh, that's when I decided I am a member of the NAACP, and that's when I decided to become more active as a member of the NAACP. I don't want to just shrug my shoulders. I want to do something. Racial prejudice exists. It exists in this country. Black and brown and indigenous people aren't being rounded up and sent to prison in the US, but they're being murdered, marginalized, 
and incarcerated at alarming rates. And mostly our country just shrugs. But that alone doesn't answer the question why I'm a member of the NAACP. Um, I can't say that I'm particularly introspective about my life. I'm not really a deep thinker. But, um, uh, you know, why I do a particular thing or don't do a particular thing. Uh, are any of you familiar with the, uh, with the expression which is attributed to Plato that um, the unexamined life is not worth living? Well, I'm not a particular adherent to that. I don't examine my life. Um, if something feels right to me, I try to do it. If something feels wrong to me, I try not to do it. Um, I don't overthink it. That's kind of the way I am. So there is like a superficial reason that I joined the NAACP and a, and a deeper one which I discerned in the course of writing this, this sermon for you. I joined the NAACP shortly after I heard Willard Lett talk about the need for reparations and that was right here in this church. Willard currently serves as a leadership ministry associate for the UUA. But I met Willard um, when I was engaged in the campaign to repeal the death penalty in New Hampshire. I went to hear Willard because I always learn something when that man opens his mouth. And, but I went to hear him talk about rep reparations, I, I have to admit, with some degree of skepticism. But by the end of his talk, I was convinced that he was right that we owed reparations to enslaved African population upon whose backs America was built and prospered, and that reparations was possible. And about five years ago, I gave a, a sermon on reparations. I still have it on my computer if anyone would like a copy. And at the end of his talk, Woolard threw down a challenge. He said, if you would have been for emancipation in the 1800s, then you have to be for reparations in the 20th century. And that inspired me. And, um, and that is the immediate reason that I joined the NAACP. As I said, I discovered a deeper meaning in the course of preparing for this sermon. And that I discovered in of all places was the book of Genesis. So I said that I, I basically didn't dwell in introspection, and I think that there's a reason for that. Because when I started to kind of ask more deeply, why did I join the NAACP? I could have joined millions of other organizations. Why this one? I kind of found myself in a, in a kind of a dark echo chamber of one group of people enslaving or killing another group of people, whether it's Tutsis and Hutsus or Croats and Serbs or, you know, Catholics, Protestants, the Inquisition, it was like, and it's not a new phenomenon. It's a very, very old phenomenon. It goes back, I guess, until the dawn of man. And that was the question that I, I asked myself, I kind of diverted myself with, was, okay, well, when is the first recorded incident of one group of people um, discriminating against another group of people just because they were a little bit different from them, maybe worshiped a different god or lived in a different place or something? And I thought, I know, I, I wonder if I can go to the book of Genesis and find the answer to that there. And, um, and, you know, and it turns out that I could. Um, the book of Genesis covers the historical period between 2000 and 1500 BC. So, um, you know, what was going on 4,000 years ago? <laughs> and the first reference that I, that I found, of course I only looked in the book of Genesis, the first reference that I found of one group of people despising another just because they were another was at the end of Genesis. And it was found in the story of Joseph. So um, Joseph, is, 
for those of you who need a refresher in the Bible, <laughs> which is all of you, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Joseph and his 12 brothers became the founders of the 12 tribes of, of Egypt, but his, Joseph was also his father's favorite, and his brothers hated Joseph, and they captured him, and they sold him into slavery in Egypt, thinking that's the end of Joseph. Well, Joseph actually did very well in Egypt, and, um, and it, it, there was a predicted seven-year famine and Joseph actually prepared for the famine, stored up food, and so now people from all over the Mideast had to go to Egypt to Joseph and ask for food. That's the story. Um, and one of those people, one of the people that went to Joseph to ask for food were his brothers. And when Joseph saw them, they, he, he, re, he reunited them. Basically, it was a happy ending to that story. But um, he brought, he asked to see his father. And so they brought his father to Egypt, and Joseph had a ceremonial dinner for him. And he invited his, all his brothers, his family, and he invited the Egyptians. And here's where I found the first reference to discrimination. The Egyptians came to the dinner, but they refused to eat with the Hebrews. So <laughs> that was it. That's the very first time that I found anything of one group discriminating against the other. And of course, um, we don't know why the Egyptians refused to eat with the Hebrews. We don't know what the source of the discrimination was. But we sure as heck know where it ended, reading the book of Exodus. It, it ended in slavery. It ended in um, poverty, it ended in violence, it ended in the killing of the firstborns, it ended in horror. Um, so that was the first lesson of di discrimination that I found in the book of, of uh, Genesis. But by the time I got to this answer, I had read the whole book. And it's, um, it's, it's a, as clear a snapshot of what the innate nature of man is, as you're likely to find. You feel, peel away 4,000 years of civilizing influence, or what we say is civilizing influence, and you have Genesis. And what Genesis revealed uh, to me about the nature of man and the nature of God and their relationship, I, I've been searching for a word for it for three weeks now. I, I know, I, I finally said, oh, it's fascinating. No, it's not just fascinating. I don't know what the word is for what Genesis tells us about ourselves. Uh, what does Genesis tell us on a, at least a superficial level basis about the nature of man? Well, he's easily manipulated, he's greedy, he's deceitful, he's arrogant, entitled, and privileged. He's cruel and violent. He's described over and over again, and I, I say he, all of us. Um, he's described over and over again as wicked and corrupt. What does Genesis tell us about the nature of God? Well, God is supposed to be all powerful, but really he's not. God is insecure and fearful. He's demanding. He wants basically three things from man. He wants respect, he wants obedience, and he wants great offerings. God really likes his bling. God can be arbitrary, petty, and terrifyingly vindictive. What does Genesis tell us about the relationship between God and man? Number one, there's a lot of tension in it. God is demanding, and man rarely satisfies his demands. God is disappointed a lot. He doesn't measure up. So I'm going to take you through a little journey now of the highlights, at least some of the highlights of the book of Genesis. It, it's not a deep dive. It's kind of the Cliff Notes, Notes version. In the beginning, 
of the book of Genesis, God is neutral and an all-powerful presence. He creates the earth, the heavens, the oceans, the animals, the plants, and things are going pretty well. God is satisfied. Um, everything is fine. And then God creates man. Why? Why did God create man? That is the primal question. Well, I'm going to read from Genesis 1.26 and tell you why God created man. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what the Genesis says. Then God said, let us make man, let us make man in our, our I think that's fascinating for those of us transgendered and pronouns and everything. God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his image. God created man to have dominion. Did God create man to be a caretaker over the earth? To be a steward over the earth? No. According to the Bible, he created man to have dominion over all human things. Before man, there was no hierarchy on earth. There was simply the interdependent web of life. Man's very presence was a disruption. Now there was a hierarchy and man was on top. The next important event in Genesis is the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And this reveals a lot about the nature of God and the nature of man. God prohibited man from one thing in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember what it was? Huh? Well, the apple, what did the apple represent? Knowledge. God, man was prohibited from eating from the tree of knowledge. Why would God prohibit that? Wouldn't it be a good thing for man to possess knowledge? Why did God choose to deny man knowledge of all things? When I read this passage, <laughs> uh, one thing came to mind. It was like, God is like Ron DeSantis. <laughs> he doesn't want people to know things because he's afraid that if people know things, if they have knowledge, then it will erode his own power. Yes, you can applaud Ron DeSantis. So what does the expulsion from the garden tell us about God? He's worried about holding on to his power, and he's insecure that man, who he after all did create to dominate, would start to dominate and might take away some of his own power. God demands obedience, and when he doesn't get it, he is punitive. What does this story tell, and, you know, and man doesn't fare much better, because what does this story tell us about the innate character of man? You might say man in his natural state. He's rebellious, he's disobedient, and he's ungrateful. As I read this, I thought, you know, it just didn't have to be this way. God could have chosen to create man to steward the creatures of the earth, to care for them, or to simply dwell among them in harmony as an equal. God could have created an Adam and Eve that were kind and respectful. God could have shared knowledge with Adam and Eve, avoiding this crisis of expulsion altogether. Instead, God set in motion this unhealthy dynamic. He created an Adam and Eve that were greedy, 
who wanted more than they were given. And that's the reason Adam and Eve were expelled from Eden, because they were not content with what they had, but they were driven by their base instinct to take more. Probably words like this have not been spoken from any pulpit in the world. But, I'll, but let me go on. <laughs> the next major event is the birth of, of Cain and Abel. And with them, even more flaws in nature of man are revealed. In a few short, it's a small, it's a little itty bitty piece of the Bible. It's just a few paragraphs. And in a few short paragraphs, Cain is revealed as a miser. He makes a stingy offering to God. Abel, in contrast, makes a, general, a generous offering to God. So God, of course, looks with favor upon Abel. God likes his bling. And this makes Cain jealous. And his jealousy makes him angry, and his anger leads him to an act of cruelty and violence, the killing of his brother Abel. So what does this brief story tell us? It tells us quite a bit about the relationship between man and God. God is powerful and he demands respect. He will look favorably upon those that give him what his, he considers his due and he will punish those that do not. Again, an image came to my mind and that was the old chiffon margarine commercial. Remember that? It's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Well, it's not nice to disrespect God. And it tells us a good deal about the innate nature of man. Again, he's greedy. He gave an insufficient sacrifice to God. He's jealous, he's cunning, he's ruthless, he's violent and deceitful. And this is just the second generation of man. So we know that it's nature, not nurture. So, so far, neither God nor man are anything to write home about. And the next major event in Genesis is, of course, the flood. And God destroys all things, all living things on earth except for Noah and his family and the animal pairs that God commanded him to rescue. So why? Why did God do this? Why did he bring the floods? Don't look to Genesis for answers. It doesn't give us any answers. It's unclear, it's virtually unexplained. In Genesis 6, 5, it says, the, law, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and he was sorry that he made man in his image. So God wanted a do-over, basically. He had a clean slate, and once again, God blew it. The very first paragraph, very first sentence after Noah uh, lands on Ararat and the dove comes back and it's safe to disembark, what did God give man? Dominance over everything. Dominion, dominance over everything again. And of course, man continued to displease God and God continued to punish man and man continued to lie, cheat, and use force to get what he wanted goes on and on and on. So this is what I learned about the nature of man and God by reading Genesis. I think two points need to be made. The first is that the various writers of the book of Genesis were reflecting what they saw as man's essential nature. If they had observed that man was kind, that man was caring, that man lived in harmony with earth, they would have reflected that in the book they reflected exactly what they saw. And the second is that they attributed, the authors attributed human qualities to God. Even 4,000 years ago, there were those that had power and there were those that did not. And those that have power were worried that they will lose it, so they demand obedience and punish rebellion. That is what the writers of the book of Genesis saw and those are the qualities, since God was supposed to be the one with power, those are the qualities that they attributed to God. 
All right. So what does this have to do with the original question I set out to ask, why am I a member of the NAACP? Remember that question? <laughs> so here is what I took from my deep dive into Genesis and the origin of man. Man, essential nature is flawed. He seeks power and dominance. He arrogant believes that he has dominion over everything on earth and seeks to have d dominion and dominance over his fellow human being. On an individual and on a community level, there is tension. There are haves and there are have-nots. There are powerful and there are powerless. Cain killed Abel because he thought Abel was favored by God. Jacob tricked and manipulated his elder brother, Esau, into giving him his birthright. Joseph's brother sold him into slavery, slavery because he was his father's favorite son. The book is full of sordid tales of power grabs. And one lesson is, it's not so good sometimes to have a brother. So again, here's the image that came to my mind as I'm reading this book, and, it, and I tell you, it's a read. Um, it was, it, it, what came to my mind was the old TV show, Dallas, and, and the power grabs in Dallas and the sibling rivalry in Dallas. Man seeks power and dominance over his fellow human beings on a community level. There is group hate. The Egyptians will not take a meal with the Hebrews group hate. And man seeks power and dominance over his fellow human being on a, on a personal level. Think of all those brotherly actions. So that is who we are at a basic level. And his, it has morphed from that base level to hundreds of years of one group of people oppressing another group of people, even to the point of murder. Romans oppressing Jews, Catholics oppressing Protestants, Protestants oppressing Catholics, Europeans oppressing everyone, um, and white Americans oppressing black, brown, and indigenous people. It goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. So why am I a member of the NAACP? For the same reason that I'm a member of the UU Church. I want to align myself with people who aspire to be better, who are trying to practice compassion and kindness instead of power and dominance. Our seven principles, which we read, are both doctrinal and aspirational. They are a call to understand our basic nature and yet to try and become better human beings, to honor all life, not to dominate it, to respect the, de the, the dignity of each human being, not to tolerate oppression and hate, to promote the democratic process, which infers the equality of all human beings, not the superiority of one group over another. If you become a member of the NAACP, you will receive a very good looking membership card. And this card includes the mission of the NAACP. It reads, the mission of the NAACP is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights of all persons and to eliminate racial hatred and racial discrimination. You will also receive a thank you note from Derek Johnson, the president of the NAACP. This is what it will say, unless it, unless it was written personally for me. <laughs> As a member, 
You have a critical role to play in advancing our vision to bring an end to the structural racism that plagues our country's infrastructure, from education and health care to the policing of black neighborhoods. Carry this card with pride, knowing that your membership brings us one step closer to actualizing the world we believe in, a world where justice, equity, democracy, and freedom are the pillars that hold up our nation. So you may notice that I, I didn't talk about the obvious here. I didn't say I'm a member of the NAACP because I'm sickened by hundreds of years of the slaughter of innocent unarmed black people um, by the government and by the mob. Two, 200, 229 black people killed just since the murder of George Floyd. Get your head around that. I didn't talk about the systemic racism that keeps our black and brown and indigenous brothers and sisters locked into poverty. I didn't talk about the over-incarceration of black people. They're 13% of our population, but 38% of our prison population. I didn't talk about the lack of health care for black people. I didn't talk about the recent Supreme Court decision that undercut the chance for educational opportunity and advancement. I assume you all, you all know this. You all know this. So those are the obvious reasons for joining the NAACP, but it didn't get to me the answer, the root of the problem, which is why? Why does this still exist? Why? Just because it does exist doesn't answer the question, why does it exist? And more importantly, it didn't answer the question, how can we evolve as a species to eradicate this kind of group hate and discrimination? That's why I went to the book of Genesis. The answer is, someone tell me. Someone tell me. But we can try. We can try. So I, I, I hoped, I tried to leave you with a positive message. And the message is that man is innately wicked, but he's capable of evolving. We don't need to repeat the past. We can mature. And there are organizations like our own UU and the NAACP that challenge our culture as a whole and help us to grow as individuals. And that's where I want to be. So I will repeat the challenge of Willard Lett. If you're a member of the UU Church and believe in its principles, then you should also be a member of the NAACP. For $35 a year, you too can have a card like this and start feeling better about who you are and who we are as a culture. Um, it's easy to become a member. Just Google Manchester NAACP and it will take you right to a page where you can sign up and I hope that you will do that. So to echo the last words that we say every Sunday, let our service begin.